So, John, everyone here buys and sells things. And so everyone wants to know how they're going to buy and sell things in the future. That's what I'm here to do. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to Campus Party. No e galera, se eu esqueci de anunciar isso aqui, mas obviamente, como eu estou falando aqui em inglês com o cara, a palestra dele vai ser em inglês. A tradução está ali, tem uma filazinha ali para a galera. Quem precisar buscar o tradutor, por favor, pega ali. I forgot to mention to announce the, the translator. So, people are going to get the translation over there. And we can just give them a, one minute. So, um, PayPal is, is part of eBay. And it's uh, the largest payments uh, system and companies in the world. How do you guys do that? You know, you handle millions of, you know, how much? Billions of dollars? How, how do you do that? Uh, with lots of servers, lots of hardware, and uh, lots of security. So um, we take it very seriously. And uh, you know, the interesting thing, our data centers are carbon neutral. They run on sustainable energy. So uh, we do it in an eco-friendly way as well. That's pretty cool. And, and you run your own data centers, right? Because, exactly. Because security is a very, very high concern for you. Exactly. No, no, uh, no cloud for us. No cloud for you. Okay. Uh, so, guys, with you, John Loon. Thanks. Hola. So that's uh, all the Portuguese I know, so sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm John Lennon, as he explains. So uh, I'm an inventor, so I invent things. I'm a developer. I write code. And uh, I like to think about the future and how different it will be. So uh, I'm going to try and take you guys on a journey. So to take you on a journey through the three different parts of commerce as I see it. Uh, four different parts, maybe. The first one is web commerce. I'm going to talk about e-commerce. Then I'm going to talk about mobile commerce. And then I'm going to talk about retail, so brick and mortar shops. And then I'm going to talk about the cool stuff, which is wearable technology. So uh, let's get started. Let's start talking about web and where it's going to go. So the future of web shopping. So let's look here. Um, this is a website. This is a really bad website, right? <laughs> this is what a website looks in many, many different places. Now, there's lots of problems with this website. But the main problem is, look at all that information on there. There is a lot of information on that website. And this is a problem now. The reason this is a problem now is not what you would think. It's actually to do with psychology. So there's something called the magpie effect. And the magpie effect is quite a new effect, and it's caused by the internet. And it's actually changing how human beings react with their world around them. So I'm quite old. When I was young, I, if I wanted information, I would have to go to a library. When I went to the library, I would have to find the book about the information. And then I got that book, and when I had it, I'd have to read that book, and I'd have to get a lot of information out of that one book. That doesn't happen anymore. Now if I want any information, I go on a search engine, I type the word or thing I'm looking for, and I get one million different hits instantly. Now I can't go and look at every single one of those one million hits. So what I actually do is I skim maybe the top 10. I just read a little bit of every single one. And what this means is my ability to process data has gone very different than it used to be, because I don't do any depth. I don't go deep into any information anymore. And what that means is now for the under 25s in our society, on average, they look at a website for only 16 seconds. That's how long they look at a website. Now, if you have a website like the one I showed you before, no one is going to buy from you because no one is got in 16 seconds going to be looking at that website and say, OK, I'm going to buy this item. It's not going to work. And this is not just young people. So people over 60 now, when they look at web, they look at three to four articles when they're looking at anything. And they only read 30% of those three to four articles. In, in you know, 10, 20 years ago, they would have bought a magazine and read the whole magazine about everything. Now the older generation is skimming. And this magfire effect is completely changing the way that we interact with things around us, mainly the web, so how you look at a website. But actually, it's changing how people read books. It's changing how people watch movies, how movies are being made, how people listen to music, because the attention span and the level of detail you now go into is much, much smaller because there's too much information. I don't believe there's too much, but there's a lot of information. So this has changed how websites need to be designed. And this has led to this, uh, the, the new type of website design and a very important movement, which is called contextual web. 
This is a much more modern website. This is a, a UK website called made.com. Now, if you look at this website, there is very, very little on that website, almost nothing. There is one product, which is a special of the day. There is links to go to different places if you want to. And this changes all the time. And this changes based on you and your preferences. If you take it a little bit further, this is eBay. This is the new eBay look and feel, so eBay 3.0, we call it. So uh, just an excuse, I share an eBay login with my girlfriend. I am not into women's hats, OK? Everybody. <laughs> But what this does is, one, based on all the things I've bought before and the interests I have, my homepage at eBay now just shows things that I might be interested in. So you can tell my girlfriend has all her hats, and then there's my geek gadgets down the bottom there. But uh, So basically, this means that instead of perhaps before, I only went to eBay when I wanted an item, now I go to eBay every single day to see is there something that I'm interested in that is going to be there. So I love guitars. I play electric guitar, and I like Gibson guitars. So every day I go onto eBay, and I look to see if there's a special bargain or someone is selling a Gibson guitar, just in case. And I might buy that guitar, but it's just in case. And I might go there for 16 seconds, and that's all. And this is contextual sh This is what it's called when your website knows what you're going to buy before you even go there. And the, the future of web shopping is very much based on that. You are going to be much lazier. You are not going to spend so much time searching for things. What you're actually going to do is be fed things, and you'll have more time to do fun things like going to the beach and, or drinking cocktails. This is dependent on one big thing, though, and that's data. It's data about you and who you are. Now, data is becoming more and more and more valuable. And there's lots of people scared of data and, you know, and people talk about the NSA and uh, who's sharing data and who's doing this and the other. But the truth is, the future of shopping and the future of commerce is going to be traded on data. It's not money. It's all about data. So I'm probably the worst person to ever call if you're, if you're from a call center. Because they ring me and they say, hello, congratulations. We would like you to take a survey. And I will say, how much are you going to pay me? And they're like, huh? <laughs> Because for me, that data, data about me is valuable. It's worth money. Because they will use that data to make money, and I should benefit from my own data. It's mine. I, it's about me. And I should actually use that data as a way to get things that I want. So my data and about what I like, what I want, and what I, what I need actually is going to depend. It's going to lead contextual shopping. But it needs to be something that I control and use and put into my wallet. Now, if you think about it, where is the one place in the world where you make sure your data is 100% accurate? Can anyone guess? It's your bank, because you get paid into your bank. It's where your money goes. And you like your money a lot. Um, so you always make sure your details are safe and up to date in your bank. Because if you don't have up to date details, you're not going to be able to buy any beer. So it's very important. So bank. The bank is where your data is secure. So it's really important to think about this. So when you're logging social media. Now, I can go on social media. I can take my dog. I can give him a profile. And I can post him up there. Now, if the login is based on social media, that is not actually going to identify the real human being. Because there's different parts of how you log in. So, you know, there's your real personality, and then there's your internet personality. So it's funny. Lots of people have multiple personalities, um, and it's not a disorder. It's just how people behave online. So lots of people think they're much better looking when they're online. They think they're richer. Uh, they think they're cooler. Um, but it doesn't mean you really are who you say you are. So if you take the details that you've got on the bank, and then you overlay a good, a good login system, then actually you can verify an individual on a website. And so when they hit that website, you can say, OK, this is really that person because they have a bank account. So we have a product, and this talk is not about our products, but we have a, a product called Login with PayPal. And Login with PayPal sits on top of your financial information. So if you log in with PayPal, the retailer knows you're a real human being. So I used to say a dog cannot have a bank account. I'm wrong. In Minnesota, in America, a dog can have a bank account. There's only one place. But otherwise, normally, a dog cannot have a bank account. Um, so I, I would argue, actually, when it comes to the future of shopping, you need a verifiable, identifiable 
login and personality that can then be used to provide contextual data to that website so it knows who you are. The other thing, another thing that's changing in the future of shopping and changing now is what we call spi the new spice routes. And this is where money and goods are flowing around the world. And you look at here, obviously Brazil is buying a lot and you look at where things are flying around the world. What is really interesting is everybody thinks everybody buys stuff from China because it's cheap and they make stuff in China. If you look at this, the Chinese are buying huge amounts of items specifically from America, from the UK and other parts of the world. So there's thing, the Chinese economy is growing and growing and they're actually buying products from the West that might have been built in China, but they're buying them from the West and it's flying back. You know, Brazil, you look at it. I, I read an article the other day that made me laugh. So. Uh, Brazil, you're famous for your bathing costumes, right? Well, you're famous everywhere in the world for the Brazilian bathing costume. Did you know that 90% of Brazilian bathing costumes are made in China? So your number one thing you're famous for is made in China now. So, so th th this is, this is really important in the future of shopping because already you can get anything you want and it can come from anywhere in the world. And that's easy to do, which means the whole thing becomes much more democratic. No longer does your local shop control what you can have, because you can have anything you want. And that is becoming more and more and growing incredibly fast. Now, what happens if there's something you want, and it, but it doesn't exist? Who, who's heard of crowdfunding? Oh, actually, we'll talk about this first. We'll talk, <laughs> sorry. We'll talk about the, another thing that's happening now. People want stuff immediately. So normally on web shopping, you used to go on and used to accept that I'm going to buy this thing on the web and then maybe in three to five days it will get delivered to my house. That's not good enough anymore because now people want to say, I'm going to go online, I want this item and I want it now. So what we've done at eBay is we've launched a service called eBay Now. And what eBay Now is allows you to buy something on eBay and have it delivered to your house within one hour. Now what's really interesting is it's not delivered to your house. It's actually delivered to where you are now. So you turn on the geolocation on your phone, and maybe you want to go and have a cup of coffee. So you walk down to the coffee shop. The courier knows that you're not at your house. It knows you're at the coffee shop. So it actually delivers it to where you are now, not where you ordered from within one hour. And this is really interesting. You watch this, and you see what people are ordering. And it's things like uh, uh, t when there's a cold. When it's cold, everybody is getting... Um, tissues to blow their nose and they get them delivered to well. Um, another thing we've seen is someone's going to work and they, let, they want to go to the gym at lunchtime and they forgot their trainers at home. So they go and buy a new pair of trainers and have them delivered to their work. Um, we're seeing p builders ordering new bits for their drill bits for their power tools or a, a new hammer because they left theirs in, uh, in the old site. And this is actually very, very interesting is the internet is no longer inconvenient because it takes too long to get our stuff. The internet is becoming even more convenient than walking down the shop because you know you're going to get what you want. This is something that I found the other day. It's make, it made me laugh. It's a uh, University of Birmingham in England. So this is the laundrette in the University of Birmingham. So you can log into the laundrette and you can see all the machines and which machines are empty and which machines are full and how long they've got to go until they will be empty. Find your machine and you can see how long it's going to be until your clothes are washed and you can go down the pub and have a beer and watch it on your smartphone. So this is like instant information. Even something simple like a laundrette is now at the stage it's provided to you now instantly. But as I said, what happens if there's something you want that doesn't exist? Five, six, seven years ago, that was really hard. So five, six, seven years ago, making a product a real product was actually quite difficult. You had to go and find a company that would make it for you. You'd have to find a bank that would invest in your, in your product. Um, and then you'd have to go for a production cycle. And you'd have to take a huge risk. Because the risk you would go and take would be, all right, I'm going to build 1,000 of these products. And if no one buys them, then I'm screwed. So I've got 1,000 products, and I've spent all my money. Now, crowdfunding has come along. And crowdfunding has completely changed how products are made. Because what is happening now is people have a good idea. And what they go and do is they put their good idea on a, on a site like Kickstarter or Indiegogo and see if people want that idea. And if they want that idea, they're prepared to pay for it. So you get your money before you even start making your products, and then you make your products. And this has completely changed, as I said, how products are made. But it's also changing other really interesting things. So movies. Who here, who here likes science fiction? Who's a geek? Yeah, Scampus Party. What do you expect? Uh, so did anyone watch Firefly here? See it? 
Was anyone really pissed off when they didn't make a second series of Firefly? Okay, so there's a crowdfunding exercise now where people are investing money through crowdfunding for them to make a second series. Now, the, the network didn't want to make it, but they're going to raise enough money for this program to be made. And this is happening with all kinds of stuff. So movies are going to be made because people are crowdfunding them before it happens. Now, last week, I sponsored the Jamaican bobsleigh team. So you've seen the film Cool Runnings, you know, the, the film with the bobsleigh team. So uh, the Jamaican bobsleigh team qualified for the Winter Olympics again this year, but they didn't have enough money to go. So they did a crowdfunding campaign, and I gave them, I think, $20 or something, and now the Jamaican bobsleigh team is going to the Winter Olympics in Sochi because of crowdfunding. So very much changed the way that we're interacting with stuff. Now, who here has heard of these things? You know what this is, everyone? 3D printer, all right? So everybody's, I don't know if you've seen 3D printers. I have a 3D printer on my desk at home. Uh, I know I'm a geek, but I have one, which is sits on my desk at home, and I make stupid things with it. But 3D printing is going to completely change almost everything you do when it comes to shopping. And so we're going to run a quick quiz now and see if people can guess. Does anyone know what this is? Any ideas? An idea? It's pasta. This is 3D printed pasta. Okay? So uh, a company called Barilla, who is a spaghetti company, has developed a method for printing pasta in three, with 3D printers. And what they're doing is, you know, it's nearly Valentine's Day, so you want to be romantic. So you can go on and you can design your own pasta shape. And then you send your design, get sent to the restaurant. And when you take your girlfriend or your wife there for dinner, the pasta she eats will be printed and designed by you. Is that romantic? You like that? It's good, hey? Do you know what this is? It's 3D printed chocolate. So uh, with a 3D printer, you can now print using chocolate. So uh, this company, again, you know, Valentine's theme, we're going to be romantic here. I can take a picture of my girlfriend. I can email that picture to this company, and they will print her face in chocolate. Kind of weird, but okay. <laughs> so here you've got 3D printed chocolate. Guess what do you think this is? These are 3D printed. So uh, this is the first time these have been printed this year, is you can now print cakes with a 3D printer. So it is capable, it is possible to print food. Now there's, there's apparently someone has printed a 3D printed burger already. Um, and there's rumors that NASA is working on 3D printed pizza for space. I'm not sure that's going to work, but it's, it's interesting. Now, if you think you can print food, already with 3D printers you can print plastics, but you can also print metals now with 3D printers. And I've heard people talking about printing organs, printing cells, printing, printing different things. My favorite one was a guy the other day I heard speaking, and he said, imagine a future where you go out and you drink too much alcohol, and you wake up in the morning and your head's like, oh, I feel terrible. You can go and print a new liver, and then psh, in you go, feeling great now. So this, this, actually, this is quite interesting. So there's a, there's a doctor um, in, in uh, Singapore who's working on interesting technology. It's a clip that clips onto your tongue, and you can simulate different flavors. So you're able to simulate sweet, sour, bitter, uh, and all other kinds of flavors using this device. Now, that's quite interesting. But when it gets, for me, it's more, more interesting. He's actually developed a markup language called Taste XML. And taste XML is a markup language for determining what something should taste like. Now, if you imagine you can combine something like taste XML with a 3D printer that can print food, then you can start to imagine how the future of shopping might get. It's because if I can start developing recipes in a language like, you know, taste XML, and if you want to buy dinner, you can buy your meal from me, and all I do is send you a markup file, a, li a little file that you can then plug into your 3D printer and it prints your dinner. Okay, that's food, but printing objects, so, you know, maybe I break my bicycle, maybe I need a part for my bicycle. Today, I have to go and find a shop, I have to I have to find the shop and make sure they got the item, the right item. It's a bit of a pain in the ass. Or I go online, I find it, I wait five days, gets delivery. But why can't that cycle shop just allow me to go online, click on the design, pay a small amount of money, download it to my 3D printer, and then print that part directly at home instantly? And I think what you'll find is that this really interesting future where you're actually starting to make everything you want yourself at home. 
And that's really quite exciting because then the economy is completely around digital data. No longer will we have big ships shipping items of products around the world because people will be able to print what they want when they need it. Campus bar, you know what this is? Star Trek? All right, this is a Star Trek replicator, right? This is from the next generation. Uh, John Luke Picard will go up to this and go, Earl Grey, hot, and he gets his tea. I actually don't think this is far away, and I actually think the future we will see for shopping on web will start to look much more like this. And maybe, you know, now that the 3D printers are, are cheap, they're getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, I would say in two years' time, almost everyone in the world will have a 3D printer in their house and they were printing items every day. And this will very much change how shopping is going to look. So I'm going to summarize the web shopping, where we are at the moment. It's going to become contextual. So your computer will know what you want before you go there. The websites you go to will be tailored to you, to your preferences, what you believe in, what you're interested in. Layered that, you layer on the social graph, you lay on other graphs like the shopping graph, your trust graph, all this is layered on top to actually give you what you want served to you directly. If you can't get what you want, someone will make it for you. So crowdfunding will become much, much more prevalent in our day-to-day -day life. And if you can't get it from someone else, you'll make it yourself with your 3D printer. So what's important to that is there needs to be a trusted and safe location for one, your data, and two, your money. And we'll talk about how, what that means in the future, but for me, this is very much the future of web shopping. So let's talk a little bit about mobile shopping. So again, we're going to talk about how that's changing your life. So my mobile phone, I call my second brain. So my mobile phone knows more about what I need to do than I do. It knows when my girlfriend's birthday is, which I forget every year, but now my mobile phone will tell me it's coming up, go and buy a present quick, print a present maybe. Um, my mobile phone has all, all, everything about what I'm going to do today. It has my preferences, it knows my passwords, it knows so much more data and essentially has become my second brain. I am lost without my mobile phone. Literally the other day, I ran out of batteries on my mobile phone and I was in Ireland and I got lost because I didn't have a map, I had no idea where I was going. So it's become so important to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Good idea. This is the lock I have at home. This is a picture of a similar lock I have at home. So this is the lock that sits on the door of my house. And this lock, basically, I open my door with my mobile phone. So I go to the door and I can log in. It uses low energy Bluetooth. As they get close, it opens the door and I go in. That's cool, but it's even cooler. If you want to come and visit my house and I'm not there, I can actually email you a set of keys. So I just send you my keys and when you get near the house, you can open it, press the thing, and my door will open. So basically, my mobile phone has replaced my keys. You can do it with your car as well. So this is the Viper system for cars. So you can use the same system, your cell phone, to open your car, start the engine. So if you live in a cold place, you can start you get your engine running. Um, you can use it to open the boot. And again, if I want to lend my car to one of you guys, I can send you the keys. So you can then now use my car. You don't need that physical key anymore. These are, these are the smart sensors. So this is uh, another crowdfunding project that I sponsored. These little devices connect to everything I own. If I lose anything, I can find them anywhere in my house because it's got one of these sensors attached to me. So basically, using my smartphone, I can find my keys if I need my keys. I can find my wallet if I lose my wallet, if I even want a wallet. But I can find anything using these sensors. So it started to replace like even my storage solution. You know what this is, a jawbone device, a fit, fitness monitor. Um, there's Fitbit, Jorno, um, Nike have got one. And this will sit around your wrist and it monitors your activity, how healthy you are, how many steps you've taken, how many calories you burn, what altitude you climb. This is linked into your mobile phone and that's then linked into your data. So you can say, uh, you know, you're not doing enough exercise, you need to do more exercise, or you haven't burnt enough calories, or maybe you shouldn't eat that extra ice cream at dinner. Again, linked to my mobile phone, linked to my second brain. This is, a heart, this is a blood pressure monitor. So this is a crowd-funded um, program that's currently being funded. Um, this tiny device I can put in my pocket. When I want to check my blood pressure, I strap it around my arm. It talks to my, my mobile phone, and I can check my blood pressure anywhere I go. So it's starting to get into medical devices. I think I missed one. No, didn't miss one. And this is, the most fascinating thing for me with mobile phones is they know where you are, is the geo data on it. So if you get a, a taxi 
from a company that's got a mobile booking, booking app. They know where they drop you off. They know where you pick you up. They know how often you travel with them. And they can use that data about you to actually work out where they're going to put their cars. That data is all coming through your mobile phone through the geolocation. And that then makes the mobile phone even more powerful because when it knows where you are and it knows who you are, then you can actually do some really great experiences. It's all about data. So, you know, I talked about contextual shopping before. So on the web, there's things like DoubleClick. And DoubleClick allow you to track someone around the web. You know where they are, know where they've been. No such thing actually exists on mobile phones. So there's only people that know what apps you've got on your phone are you and maybe Apple if you've got an iPhone. But that data is not shared. Now imagine if you, if you can get, start getting contextual based on the apps on a phone. So if they know you have seven taxi booking apps, they know you have um, apps around music, particularly you know, you've got Spotify or, or Napster or something like that, then what you can actually do is start to, to predict what people will want based on the apps they have installed. That doesn't exist yet. That does need to actually start happening. And a company like eBay that has the most data about shopping in the world is in a really good position to actually help provide that data. So I think you know, mobile shopping is going to get even more contextual because essentially you don't have time to press buttons and log in and do things and that. You want your mobile phone to essentially be telling you what you should be doing and what you should be buying. It should actually be doing stuff for you as well. So this is a wallet. So this is a picture of someone on the internet of what's inside their wallet. Now there's a lot of stuff there. And I would argue that you can replace all that stuff with your cell phone today. So everything that you have in your wallet, you can replace. And it's an interesting experiment to see, like, really, do you need to carry all that information? Is there an app that can deal with it? So one of the first things, of course, is loyalty cards. Probably the most plastic you have in your wallet at the moment is loyalty cards for different stores. That's stupid. These are just things with numbers on them, right? You can put that in, in a mobile phone. There's things like Card Mobili and, and other apps that allow you to basically take all your loyalty cards and just install it in an app. Your wallet will be so much smaller if you don't carry this plastic. There's coupons. Lots of people love coupons. They love collecting coupons. It's a very finite market. There's a very small but very active user group of coupons. But again, there's no reason you can't put a coupon into an e-wallet, into a mobile phone. And when you start to think about it, if your mobile phone's going to replace your wallet, you need to pay with it. And this will show you some really cool PayPal technology that, that we've, we've got. The first one is something called Card.io. So Card.io is a piece of PayPal technology that if I want to pay online, all I do is I take my credit card, I take my mobile phone, I hold my phone over my credit card, it takes a picture and I've paid. So actually, I don't need to type in anything because essentially the mobile phone is just taking a picture of a credit card to make a payment. That's pretty cool. That saves a lot of time. And if you install the PayPal SDK on your app, then you get that by default. Another cool piece of technology that we just bought is something called Venmo Touch. So Venmo Touch, if I want to buy something, the first time I go to a website, I put my credit card details in. The next time I go to any other website, what happens is I don't need to put my credit card details in again because they're saved from the first time I put them on a different website. So say I bought something on Uber, I bought a taxi on Uber, the first time I go to Yplan, what happens is I don't need to type anything. My credit card's there already, I click pay and I've paid. So it basically means your mobile token and your mobile phone identifies and authenticates you. So that's also making that shopping experience much, much simple. And then you think if you're going to replace that wallet with a technology, then you need to think, how are you going to pay your friends? So how are you going to pay each other? Um, and one of the interesting things is if you want to kill cash, which I really want to kill cash, I hate cash. If you want to kill it, then you need a way to make it easy to pay each other. And what we've got with this, the Venmo app here is a social networking tool that allows me to see who owes me money and who I owe money to. So using this, when I go and look at someone's profile, I say, OK, this is Bob. Bob likes Chelsea Football Club. He's married to Susan, and he owes me two reais. I can see that on his social network. And I can see that and then exchange money back and forth through that way. And that means, actually, it's very, very viral. It's so simple to do this. That this viral, viral program goes out. And this was voted one of the best apps in the, in the world the last year. So it's a, it's a pretty cool app. So if you just have the PayPal app, if I want to pay anyone in the world any money, all I need is their email address. And I can just put their email address in, put money, and I can send anyone money in any currency in the world. So you're able to do this now. There's no reason you can't get rid of your wallet when it comes to cash, when it comes to payment in that way. But then you have to think, how are you going to pay someone else? 
if I want to uh, accept money from you, say I want to um, open up a business and I want to accept money. So I could go to my bank, I could get a credit card machine, I could pay X amount of money every month, or I could use my cell phone. So this is a PayPal Here device. So this device allows me to take chip and pin cards from any of you. Um, if, you if, I, if I want a payment, you just come up to me, give me your card, I take this thing out of my pocket, Bluetooth connection to my phone, put the card in, pin number, you've paid me. So this means anyone can become a merchant, anyone can accept credit cards. And the, the PayPal Here device we've got, this one with chip and pin is available in the UK. Uh, we have one which is Swipe, which is available in America, Australia, Japan, um, Singapore, lots of other countries. And uh, you know, we're, we're looking at try when we will bring this to Brazil. But again, now your mobile phone is a cash register. <clears throat> so. Mobile shopping, to summarize, massively, massively contextual. So your mobile phone needs that data about you. It will tell you what you want to do, when you're going to do it, and how you're going to buy it. Your mobile phone is your second brain. It knows more about you than you do, and you can actually be running more of your life through your mobile phone. Your wallet will be accessed through your mobile phone, and this is where it's important. Your wallet will not be your mobile phone. Your wallet will be accessed by your mobile phone, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. You will buy, sell, accept money of friends, and everything through your mobile phone soon. It will st you will stop carrying the leather wallet that you have in your pocket. Your mobile phone will become your wallet as far as these things go. Okay, let's talk about the future of retail. So I like this picture, and the reason I like this picture is, it is this is the future of retail shopping. This shopping cart is retired. He's now on a beach having some fun. This is what is going to happen to shopping carts. They're, they're going to the beach. We won't need them anymore because the future of retail is going to be completely different. Minority Report. Who saw Minority Report here? Good. Do you remember the bit when Tom Cruise walks into the shop? He's trying to escape and all the holograms are like, welcome back. Welcome back, Tom. Would you like to buy this item? Or, you know, last time you were here, you bought this, Tom. And he's like, shut up, shut up, stop talking. This is actually happening already. So this is possible today. And that's when, we t when we're looking here, this is actually what we're doing at PayPal. And I explain that in a little bit. It's bad for secret agents. It's good for everyone else. So the worst thing about shopping. What is the worst thing about shopping, do you think? I'll tell you now, the worst thing about shopping is paying. Who likes to pay? No, so you know one. It's the worst thing. And you want to know what's even worse? They make you queue to do the worst thing about shopping. So you have to stand in a queue to do the most miserable thing, which is pay for stuff. This is stupid. This is really stupid. Paying and the way that you pay and queuing for payment has got to go away. So the future of shopping in a retailer store, you will not go to a till. You will not queue. Your payment will be invisible. And what will happen is payment will just happen. And it's easy. You'll do more of the fun stuff, which is picking out what you want to buy or trying things on. So that, less of the bad stuff, which is actually making the payment. Another bad thing about retail shopping is you go to the shop and the thing you want is not there. It's an uh, annoying waste of time and uh, means that people shop on the web. So what we're doing and what you'll see um, is there's a popcorn machine over on our, on our Bankero over there where you can actually try this product. And this is something called PayPal Check-In. And what happens with PayPal check-in is very similar to something like you can check in to a shop before you go there. So you can open the PayPal app today, and you can do this in Brazil. Open the app up, go and look at what shops around you take PayPal, and you can check into that shop. When you check in, what happens is your face appears on their till. So when you walk into the shop, your face is already there. And when you want to pay, you say, I want to pay, and they say, cool, you've paid. Because your face is your identify. So it means you don't have to, you have to do anything. You don't have to walk up to the till. You don't have to hand over a car. You're paying using your face. So that's pretty cool, hey? And, um, and you can try it. So if you want to try the popcorn machine we have over there, you can actually try the experience and get some popcorn using PayPal. And we have a few coffee shops in Sao Paulo where you can actually go and buy your coffee with PayPal using check-in. This is, this is even better. So this is the PayPal here point of sale device. So I talked about the little device. This is one that you can have in a shop. It uses an iPad and a, and a, and a uh, PayPal here device. Really, that's, you know, it's a bit of an effort for some people having to open an app and check in. You know, it makes a bit of research. So we've made it even easier. And we've invented something called the PayPal beacon. 
And the PayPal Beacon is a low energy Bluetooth device that plugs into the retail store. So they plug this in, this is low energy Bluetooth. When you walk in with your mobile phone for the first time, it wakes your phone up. So it says, oh, by the way, this store takes PayPal. Would you like to check in? You say, yeah, I'll check in. The next time you go to that store, you don't even have to take your mobile phone out of your pocket. So it knows you walk in. As you walk in, it says, oh, John, he's back. Your face is on the till. I can now pay. So completely hands-free shopping, Tom Cruise Minority Report style. So basically, that's able to happen. The nice thing about this is the retailer knows that you're in the shop before you bought something. The retailer knows with check-in that you're coming into the shop before you arrive, which means if they use the data that we give them combined with the data they have about you, when you arrive, they can give you a really nice experience. So what we've done with a few places in the US already is you can order your coffee or your juice before you even arrive. You can say, I'm going to be there in 10 minutes. I want this juice. You walk in. It's ready. They see your face. They just give you your juice. You walk out. You don't have to queue. You don't have to wait. You don't have to do anything. Also, imagine if you go to the same coffee shop every day. You always have the same coffee. So maybe they know you're coming. They know you checked in. Oh, John's coming. Make his coffee now. When I walk in, my coffee's already waiting for me. Or perhaps they know my birthday, the date of my birthday. And the day they arrive, there's my favorite coffee waiting, but they made me a cake as well. Now, this is actually changing because they... That data means that they can give you good customer service. They can give you good experience, which is the only way that the retail, traditional brick and mortar stores will actually compete with online. Because what that means is they can treat you like a human being. They can treat you specially, just like your grandmother. So in the old days, when your grandmother went to the shop, they knew what she liked, they knew what bread she liked, they knew everything about her. So as she walked in, we are welcome back. Here's all the stuff you like. We have your favorite uh, sugar in stock, etc. With this, you can have the same experience. And this actually might make me go back into shops because the moment I do all my shopping online, but if I know I can go to a shop and get human attention that looks after me and treats me specially, then actually I will start going back into shops. And this is really important. This is going to completely change shopping. What's wrong with this picture? Well, for me, what's wrong with this picture is there's too many shopping bags. And it's not because I don't like to spend money. It's actually because it's stupid to carry all that stuff, right? So you, you go to a shop and you want to buy six bottles of wine. It's a real pain at the moment because you say, I want six bottles of wine. And then you give you this big box and you've got to carry it back to your car. When, what's going to happen is actually, if you think back to eBay now and what we had there, is you're going to go into shops, you're going to pick the items you want, and they're to your house when you want them. You're no longer going to need shopping bags. You're no longer going to need the shopping trolley because what will happen is the shop will change completely and become a new type. It's going to become a combination of a museum and a warehouse. So you'll go to a shop and you'll go into the shop to try things on. So not every shop will have every color of every item. Not every shop will have every size and every color of every item. Every shop will have one color of every item and one size of every item, but not both because you don't need both. What you do is you say, this is the right size, and I want it in that color, and I want it in my house in 20 minutes, and that's how it's going to happen. So you're no longer carrying things around. And think what this will do to congestion. Think this will do to traffic problems. You no longer need to take your car because you don't need to carry anything back. You can use public transport. You can, and it's going to change the way that shops look, the way that shops feel. And lots of retailers are scared of becoming showrooms. But actually, they shouldn't be scared of becoming showrooms because what they should be is proud of having the best showrooms with the products that people can, can, people can get instantly at a price that's better than everyone else. And this is how shops are going to look. You'll no longer have racks and racks of clothes and items everywhere. You'll have very minimal, very simple shops where you can try things on and get them delivered to you. So let's talk a little bit about wearables. So um, I'm a geek. I have a Pebble. I actually have three smartwatches because I'm a real geek. Um, Wearables are starting to change something. You, if you've not got a wearable on now, I reckon in a year, a year and a half, you will be carrying something with you that is wearable technology. And this is going to also change how you interact. Whether it's a wearable or a third-party device, it's actually going to change things in an interesting way. So again, this is a smartwatch. This is a Pebble smartwatch. Think about something like an NFC payment. An NFC payment at the moment could be out with a card, tap the card on a thing or out with your phone, tap your phone. Wouldn't it be easier if you could just do that with your hand? That would be a much simpler NFC payment. NFC doesn't 
I don't care, but it would. If my smartwatch can be telling me when I can check into places, if my smartwatch can be telling me when I pay for stuff, or when there's discounts, when there's coupons, and it just sits there and talks to me, then actually I can get a good shopping experience. And already there's two smartwatch companies that have integrated PayPal into their smartwatches. And you're going to see, be using this much more as your second screen. I don't think in two or three years' time, you'll be walking around with your mobile phone in your hand. I think your mobile phone will stay in your pocket or in your handbag for most of the time and actually your wearable technology will be how you interface with your phone. And then there's the, the goggles, the glasses. So you could have these to find information, but I think actually a very good use for these will be the people in the stores, the, the shop assistants. I can see these guys wearing, um, whether it's Google or anyone else's glasses, and actually as you walk in the store, as you check in, they can see, hey, hey, John has just walked in the store. And you know what? John last night was on our website, and John looked at these website and he was there for five minutes looking at the jeans but he didn't buy them why don't I go over with those jeans in John's size now and say last night you were looking at these jeans would you like to try them on because all the data is connected and they can see through the glass that I'm there and I'm ready to go I think you'll see these actually being used in that type of environment pretty soon does anyone seen this pattern this is funny this is the Sony smart wig and the smart wig is, uh, Sony have just patented it. This is a picture from their patent. Um, it's a wig that interacts with your cell phone through little vibration panels in your hair. I don't need it, obviously, but um, I don't know. Maybe it will work for some people. But the smart wig is perhaps a wearable technology. It's another alternative. Does anyone know what this is? This is a Google contact lens. So uh, if you're worried about privacy, <laughs> this gets really interesting. Um, but the Google contact lens is not as sinister as it sounds. What this contact lens actually does is um, it measures the glucose in the, the liquid around your eye and, if, and communicates with your phone. And if you're diabetic, what this actually will do is tell you when to take your insulin because it's communicating with your mobile phone. And so again, wearable technology that's a little sinister, but actually it's, it's a pretty cool use for technology. Has anyone seen this before? This is the, the hug jacket. I like this technology. So this is a jacket that you can buy, and you can buy one for your girlfriend or your partner. And then when you want to give her a hug, wherever she's in the world, you give yourself a hug, and she gets a hug. So if you think about Valentine's, maybe, that's good. <laughs> But actually, when you start to think about fabrics and materials, fabrics and materials can become intelligent. You're already starting sensors being built into these materials. So you're going to start having clothes that tell you when you really need to wash them, which is ideal for, for geeks like me. You'll say, okay, time to wash your t-shirt now, really seriously. Um, so actually, the sensors are starting to get built into communicating through. This is, this is a, a sensor that um, is going almost everywhere. This sensor is quite interesting because it can sense things like altitude, it can sense different gases, it can sense all kinds of stuff, again, connected to your smartphones. And I imagine you are going to have pretty much sensors in everything around you very, very soon. Almost everything in your house will have some kind of smart sensor and will actually start talking either to your cell phone or to your home hub and start doing things for you. And, you know, we've been talking for years about the smart fridge and the, the internet fridge. Well, it exists, all right? These exist already. And we'll come to the stages where you're getting low on milk. Your fridge will order your milk from you. You know, you're running out of toilet paper. Your, your toilet roll will order you a new box of toilet roll. Um, so all of your devices around you will actually start ordering things for you. So you'd have less time doing the boring things, less time doing the things that you're not interested in. Like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like shopping for food that much, but if my fridge and my cupboards and my kitchen can order my food for me and I don't have to worry about it, then I can have more time to doing the fun things. Um, another interesting thing is, already it's estimated 25% of all spam in the world is actually coming from smart devices already because whoever's building these things is not thinking about security. So actually, a lot of the spam email is coming from things like e-fridges, as is today. So it's happening, it's around you, it's here already. And when it comes down to it, the important thing is you need one wallet, and that wallet needs to sit in the cloud and talk to all these devices. Your wallet is not your phone or phone, your wallet is not the thing in your pocket, it's not your computer. Your wallet should sit in the cloud, your wallet should talk to your mobile phone, talk to your computer, talk to your fridge, talk to your watch, talk to your car, 
talk to everything else in your life. And that's why the philosophy we have at PayPal is we put your wallet in the cloud and we give you APIs that allow you to communicate with that wallet. And we believe we're, we're in the prime position to do that. So if you're excited about this future, um, and if you're a developer, who here's a developer? Who writes code? That's good. So um, we have a competition that we run every year. It's called Battle Hack. And uh, Battle Hack is a competition. Do you recognize this guy here? Oh, yes, me. <laughs> they, uh, this competition is happening every year. And we're first time we're coming to South America. And uh, we're going to be in uh, Mexico City this year. And if you come, you can come to the hackathon. And uh, the hackathon is for good. The winners of that hackathon will go together for a final in San Jose where they will compete for a top prize of $100,000. And there's no strings attached. If you want to spend that $100,000 on beer, that's okay. You have to buy me one beer. Otherwise, you can spend it on beer. But this is a globe. And we've got hacks all over the world. London, Moscow, Tel Aviv, Singapore, Australia, everywhere in the world. So you'll be hacking and competing for the prize of the best developer in the world. And I'll show you a very quick video. So if you're a developer, please come and compete. Please come and compete. And thank you very much. And thank you for having me. If you've got any questions, I'll be around. Cheers. <laughs>